Hello there, this is Greg Braille from Apogee. And this is Alan from Apogee as well. And uh, we're here to talk about API-centric architectures for context-aware apps. Uh, we're gonna get started right now. Um, I imagine a few more people might still be joining, but we have a good crowd now, so why don't we get started? I'm Greg Braille. I'm actually replacing Ed enough for this webinar. I'm uh, the Chief Architect of Apogee, and basically I'm here to, to help Alan, who's going to be the one who's really going to be driving this whole presentation. So why don't you introduce yourself? Sure. So I'm the product guy for uh, Apogee Insights, uh, and, and I love APIs. <laughs> excellent. Excellent. I just wanted to mention two quick things before we get started. Uh, first of all, uh, this webinar and the video will be available after it's over on youtube.com slash Apogee. There is no reason to furiously take notes um, if you don't want to. Um, we'll have video, we'll have audio, we'll have all kinds of things. We don't have a podcast yet, but maybe we'll do that in the future. Also, the slides will be available at slideshare.com slash Apogee. There, so again, uh, you'll be, you, there's no need to, to ask, um, can I have the slides? You will be able to have the slides after the webinar is over. And the last thing is, of course, we have here in the webinar, we have chat and we have Q&A. Um, we'll be monitoring that during the presentation. We'll try to get as many questions as we can. We'll probably talk for about 40 minutes and leave some time at the end for questions. Um, if for some reason there are a huge number of questions, what we often do is we'll actually write a blog post after the webinar is over responding to them. So with that, I'm going to turn things over to Alan and he's going to walk us through the presentation. Okay, so um, I just want to uh, describe a little bit about what we're going to be talking about today. First, we're going to give an overview of what is a context-aware app. Okay. Uh, we're going to talk about two architectural patterns. Uh, specifically Lambda architecture and microservices. Um, Greg is also going to give a little bit industry overview of, from an architecture perspective, mm -hmm. the evolution of these technologies. Then we're going to get really into the interesting part. We're going to do a deep dive into Netflix, tell you how Netflix actually works. And then we're also going to tell you a little bit of how, how we apply Lambda architecture and microservices to Apogee Insights. All right, so what is a context-aware app? These are the apps that you all know and love. You know, Google Now, uh, your Netflix recommendations, uh, you know, Facebook, all the news feeds in your Facebook. And what makes these apps really um, context-aware, and what does it mean to be context-aware, is that it knows everything around you. So where you are, what weather it is, what mobile device it is, the best time to engage you, and who you're interacting with. And specifically, so these are all events that are happening in our system. And the way to think about events, which is very important, is the ability to split up the types of events. So you have events that are historical. These are events that happened way in the past. You have events that are fairly recent. This is the last day, last hour, last 10 minutes, last minute. And then you have what's happening right now. And you need to take in all these pieces of information together to give you a result. And the reason why we're splitting up these events is because the you need different technologies and architectural patterns to deal with all these three types of events and merge them up to give a good answer. Okay, and I assume when we talk about context-aware apps, we're talking about things like web pages that give me shopping recommendations, you know, Google Maps saying, you know, there's a gas station near you, you know, that sort of thing, right? Yeah, and in okay. top level, it could be broken down into anytime you're, you're getting an outreach, push notifications, email, okay. that kind of stuff, as well as to get you engaged, right. but also um, when you're actually using an app or you're using a web page, reading a, a e even an email, what recommendations are in the system are right. represented. Okay. So the reason why it's so important from an architecture standpoint is we just have way too much technology. You know, every single day there's a new vendor that comes out with the, the next silver bullet. And so it's not so much about what technology to use. Uh, as architects, you gotta really think about what is the right way to architect these technologies together to maximize the usage. Mm -hmm. This is where Lambda architecture starts coming in. And the, the, this is, Lambda architecture was really coined by Nathan Mars. He's, uh, he's a guy who created uh, Storm, which is a complex event processing engine. Uh, but probably his bigger contribution is this architectural pattern which states that you want to have one set of technologies that does your batch processing, mm -hmm. dealing with your historical events. You want to have one layer that's dealing with your very recent events, they call it the AKA the speed layer. 
And you also then you want to be able to merge those results using some like called something called a serving layer. Okay. And the serving layer is actually the part where people least understand. This is this is the part where you're trying to make you have to make it geared towards the apps that you're actually integrating with. Right. So the technologies that you choose, whether it's SQL, whether it's NoSQL, whether it's like high scalability, uh, consistent, et cetera, it depends on the apps that's actually in integrating with okay. it. So just to, to kind of you know, take a step back on this, I think what you're saying is that what, what Nathan came up with is the technologies we use for batch technology, they may take a really long time to run. They may take a day to produce a result, and that's not sufficient, but those kinds of insights are worth taking a day to calculate. And then there are things you can calculate much more quickly, right? And that's, that's your speed layer. What's the kind of, of, of processing time someone should expect in a good speed layer? So, um, so it's, the, it's about the recency of the events, okay. right? So, uh, and it also depends on your use case. So okay. if you think about something like uh, 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 Storm, Twitter Storm, right, right. right? It's gonna be able to take events from like maybe the last day. Because usually okay. the batch layer generates results based on your last maybe one year, two years of history, okay. and it generates every day. You want this to be on the order of magnitude between a day and right. And, uh, so less than a day. Same. Hopefully, maybe even the last few minutes if you're lucky. Right? Correct. Yeah. And you look. You think about Twitter. Twitter gives you results on how many people have re read you, and you want to get. You want. You want it to be fairly yeah. accurate, right? So yeah. it's like up to the second. So. So at, at the same time, the serving layer. There, I assume that the real challenge there is latency, right? Correct. You need to be able to return a result. When I click the app and I say, I'm looking for shoes, you want the th shoes you want me to buy to be right there at the top. Exactly, yeah. It's all about latency, it's all about random IO, it's okay. all about, depending on your app use case, scale. Right. Because right? you have millions and millions of concurrent applications connecting to your serving layer at a time. Right. Okay. So the next thing is, the next part of it is microservices. And there's a lot of hoopla about what it is, but at the end of the day, what a microservice is, is uh, the ability to deconstruct an application not using libraries, uh, but rather using a set of services. Okay. And, and you know all about this, so tell me a little bit about what you think about it. Well, microservices, I mean, I find very interesting because there's, there's some old and there's some new in it, right? I mean, the idea of composing an architecture out of a lot of services is certainly nothing new, right? I mean, the SOA movement attempted to do this. I think what the microservices movement has done is they've, they've utilized some new technologies. So for instance, they've utilized OS containerization via the most popular version is Docker, which allows you to have a lot of much smaller containers. So rather than having a giant server that as someone I used to work with at Apogee, still work with that Apogee app just says you would you would buy and you would put in a box and you would name and you would carefully take care of it. Now you have hundreds or thousands or tens of thousands of these little tiny containers that are automatically brought up and down and scaled up and down. So it becomes possible to have a whole lot of services. And the neat thing about these microservices architectures is they use very lightweight lightweight technology like Node.js which can run on a couple megabytes, right? Um, it becomes feasible to have many, many of these things. And developers love it because each developer is responsible for a little piece of functionality that they can test separately and deploy separately and not have to wait for the whole giant release. Um, it'll be interesting to see where it all goes because I think people are taking this idea of microservices and they're taking something that would normally be like three files in their web app and yeah. turning it into 14 microservices. I'm, I'm exaggerating a bit, but I read a blog last night from some guy who turned his fairly simple website into eight microservices and he was really excited. That'll be an interesting conversation for later, but for this context, the ability to have as many services as you want almost come up and down and scale automatically and not have to have huge amounts of hardware architecture just because of the design of your software is really interesting. So, you know, as we said, yeah. like the two major use cases is targeting recommendations. So it'd be good, uh, good, uh, good to actually start thinking a little bit about from an industry view yeah. uh, where we're, where, what's happening with these kinds of architectures and context apps. Right, right. I mean, so clearly, I mean, what we have here is there's a lot of information coming in, right? And there's a huge amount of, there's a huge amount of money to be made. I mean, obviously, Google exists and is able to build 
self-driving cars yeah. because of the money they make on advertising. And the reason they make money on advertising is because they deploy, you know, huge amounts of expensive brain power to figure out how to do this, how to take this huge stream of data. And I suspect in the early days probably entirely using a batch layer, turn that into you know, turn that into a set of recommendations that then they serve up using probably the world's most scalable speed layer, right? That's what a Google query is, you know, like you mentioned yesterday, you're hitting who knows how many servers and who knows how many places <laughs> in a few milliseconds and it gives you back an answer. The reason it can do that is because they have this very complex batch technology they've developed over literally a decade or two that can actually turn this thing into, into an interesting thing. So I think the interesting thing that's happening here is the combination of this with this, the the speed layer is, I think, a more recent development. Correct. Right. You know, this is this is kind of a, this is actually a report from Gartner. Yeah. They, they're they're actually recognizing that this is a problem that the industry itself is trying to solve, and lots of co companies, not just the Googles of the world, are solving. Right. right. The thing about it that's interesting is that all these technologies, they've existed before, but I think what's really interesting is that, in order to make context of where apps work, you've got to have everything. You can't just have a complex event processing engine. You just can't have MapReduce. Okay. You gotta yeah. have, uh, especially rules, like being able to put uh, business rules on top of your recommendations, business rules on who you target. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, having that all come together is really, really, really hard. It's non-trivial. Yeah, and it's interesting. I'm, I'm starting to think, just as a consumer of this stuff, that doing it badly is in some ways almost worse than doing it well. Right? <laughs> like I've been, I was looking at cameras on Amazon about a week ago, yeah. and now this week, every single web page I go to has a picture of that camera. Yes. Which I, I only already bought used, but anyway. Um, so it's interesting to see like, it's kind of annoying after a while. Right? Correct. So yeah. I think that you know the challenge is how to do this the right way. The cool thing is that even Gartner is actually thinking about the concept of having uh, a batch layer, yeah. right? As well as a, they call it an on-demand layer, but really this is the microservices layer. Okay. It's taking an actual API call and let, using the context from that API call to make a result. So it's not just, they're actually, they're actually thinking about, I think the industry is also moving to a point where everybody's thinking about splitting these systems too. Well, I think this is a really interesting point you're making that people might not completely get, which is that I think a lot of people understand systems like, oh, I'm building the app, and now over in the corner I'm gonna put some recommendations, call the recommendations API, and it'll give me a list of recommendations that were generated yesterday, or the day before, or last week, using yeah. some sort of Hadoop process. I think what you're saying is, first of all, that those recommendations can be a lot more real time, and that's what some of the companies like Netflix are talking about, which you're gonna right. get to. And th the other point is that, they don't have to be a separate thing. They can be embedded in everything you do. Netflix has a pretty complicated architecture. Uh, this is, t guys, if, if, if you're interested, go to Netflix blog, uh, search on recommendations architecture. This is gonna come up, there's a lot of deep dive, but I wanna kind of explain this to you and, and go through every, um, every piece of the architecture that they have here. Now they use slightly different words. So instead of batch layer, they're using the word online. Instead of the, the word speed layer, they're using near line. So not quite real time, not quite bash, not quite offline, but it's you know somewhere in the middle. Okay. And online is there is basically the, the layer that's taking in the um, is making like on demand kind of computations. So let's kind of go through all of these layers together and then mm. kind of like bring it all together. Okay. So the batch layer, it's it's basically taking your entire history. Uh, probably your entire history up to maybe a day, uh, maybe the last day that you've actually done, uh, you've watched videos. And uh, they're doing a pretty complex uh, matrix algebra in there, singular value decomposition. It's all batch algorithms. And the thing is that this is the place where you can actually do your really, really complex you know, calculations. And so what they're doing is they're basically pre-computing a lot of results for you for different scenarios, right? So. You could be pre-computing results for stuff you might watch on the phone versus stuff you might watch on the TV. They're pre-computing for different situations. Okay. And but presumably these models take, there's a lot of, like you said, complex algebra, algebra of some, it takes a long time to run. Right? 
right? Correct. Yeah. So all the results that are that are that are being generated are being flown in Cassandra. Right. And so this Cassandra is their quote unquote serving layer. But they're mostly using traditional Hadoop kind of stuff to do this. Correct. Yeah. Okay. The speed layer, which is the called the near line layer, they're also doing um, they're doing some algebra, uh, mm -hmm. matrix algebra, not quite as complicated as uh, what's happening in the uh, offline layer, the, the batch layer. It's medium complexity, and uh, you know one of the things that's interesting is that they're putting the data, these result data, not into just one serving layer, but three right. serving layers using three different technologies, which using is very three interesting. Three different technologies, correct? Now, is that just because they they have a lot of teams and they all like to do their own thing, and they couldn't get the MySQL guys to stop using MySQL? <laughs> well, it's actually because. Different serving layers have different advantages, right? Okay. Like MySQL is still great at doing some types of calculations that you can't do in Cassandra uh, or this uh, EV cache, which is actually a key value pair cache right. of memory. Um, it allows you to do, you know, SQL allows you to do group by functions, things of that sort. Yeah. Uh, that you can't get out of Cassandra or EV cache. And right. if you if you don't have a high scale requirement. Um, and for example, uh, in the use of in other use cases, it might have like business analysts who wants to look at the results. Yeah. And we're not talking about millions of companies. And they want to slice and dice and roll things up in different ways. Exactly, yeah. Okay. Uh, EV Cache, which is their uh, real, is, is basically their in memory data store. Yeah. Very, uh, very simple query patterns. It's key value pair. And that's all. Right, that's it. But it's, so it's great for like uh, storing in the data. That, and, and making very simple kind of calculations on the fly, mm -hmm. uh, but it doesn't allow you, it doesn't have the kind of like query flexibility as what you get from like Sandra. Right. And then their microservices layer, right, and, and, and is, is, is really about serving the responses in real time. So there's actually some calculations that are going on, like when you actually make an API call from the UI, there are calculations going on, and it's actually merging the results from all three serving layers. Mm -hmm. the, the results are in Cassandra, the results in MySQL, results in EV Cache okay. to give you a final recommendation. Oh, that's interesting. I didn't realize they used all three for everything. And I know that they are very heavy users of microservices internally. Yeah. And as well as their UI. And actually, what, what, you actually, what, they, don't, what they don't have on this picture is their whole API tier where they have actually customized API for every individual UI. So they have a very, very complex architecture. Yeah, this is this is just a gross simplification of what yeah. what they really have underneath the hood. This, yeah. They're probably between the algorithm service and the UI client. We're talking about uh, you know dozens, potentially even dozens of microservices that are used, uh, and and maybe two or three layers of yes. API calls that are being happening in order to actually serve you that one recommendation. And this is all in the service of getting more subscribers to stick with them and keep wanting to sign up. Exactly. Which is big business for them. Big business. The other part too about this, the online computation layer is also used for a lot of fallback as well. And what that means is that sometimes you might not have a personalized recommendation for a particular user. So you might want to use the recommendations based on what's most popular, what's trending overall in the, uh, in the last day, the last hour mm -hmm. that people are watching. So this idea of fallback and being in uh, fallback, as well as applying some, you know, simple rules for ensembling the different results from different batch layers, from different both the batch and speed, and merging okay. it all together and giving them a, a final result. You know, so putting it all together, uh, you know, they are, uh, Netflix has a combination of a batch layer as a, uh, a speed layer and a microservices tier that's doing these. You know, real-time calculations. And this is only part of the Netflix architecture, as I understand it. Correct. This is only the recommendation part of the Netflix architecture. So, pretty large company, very, very big commitment to hiring software developers, building things in-house, yeah. making them open source as a way to attract more people to want to come work for them and build more things in-house. Probably from a, a, a buy versus build or a cost perspective, Maybe not all companies would make the same choice they did. They clearly decided that building the stuff themselves on top of open source was the most cost effective thing, but this is a big investment. And you know, actually a lot of these components, for example, uh, Netflix, Manhattan, and Hermes, some of these are not actually open sourced at all. 
mean, okay. this is this is core proprietary things right. that they're doing. Because you're right, it is their business. Yeah, We're I think I, yeah, about, I think the purple is Netflix stuff here. Yeah. And, and there's there's things that you know they, they, they don't they don't want people to it's their core competency right yeah. so you know depending on the kind of problem like when I when, you, you know you, you often I get questions of, about hey should I go build something like what Amazon has right and they see these papers like Dynamo Dynamo DB that come out and and my 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 reaction to them is that you know, it depends on the class of problem you're trying to solve. If the problem is a tens of billions of dollars problem, yeah, you should probably, you know, build it yourself, build some proprietary IP that you won't tell anybody about, leverage open source as much as possible um, for the things that are not differentiated, and, uh, and and go build it. But if you're trying to build, you, you know, you can't expect to have, you don't want to build a really really complex system for a smaller bet. Value problem. You want to use the appropriate technology and appropriate costs. And I think we might also be getting to a point where there are, there is enough technology out there. You don't have to build it yourself. Again. Yeah. These guys started out many years ago, right? Yes. Yeah. Now I imagine you're going to tell us now about the Apogee product <laughs> that does a lot of these things we're talking about. Yeah. So so you know Apogee, we're we're, we're an enterprise software company. Right. And uh, our goal is to provide platforms to help people yeah. build these kinds of systems without having to uh, do it yourself entirely, right? Yes. Um, and so the, the kind of takeaway, and similar to a lot of companies out enterprises, our big takeaway is how can we actually enable companies to build, let's say, a recommendation system, leveraging the best practices of what the uh, Netflix and Amazon have done. And this example of recommendations when you think about recommendations, it's not just your traditional product recommendations, but you can have recommendations in anything. Search recommendations is another mm -hmm. one. Uh, you know, if you make a phone call to a customer service rep uh, and you, you're complaining about your telephone service, the, 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 the telephone, the rep can actually give some recommendations on other services that you might be interested in. So recommendations can be in every, anywhere. And I think enterprises are realizing that if you want to get all these recommendations everywhere into your architecture, you really need to start focusing on APIs. So that's why, uh, you know, coming back to why API-centric architectures is needed for these contextual apps. So kind of show you the, at a high level the uh, architecture that, that we built in. Okay. Um, it looks very similar to the, the, the Lambda architecture you described earlier. <laughs> yeah, we're not, we're not innovating on the, uh, we're not innovating on the, um, the architecture side, but we're innovating on the implementation side. Right. We have Insights has a proprietary algorithm that generates uh, batch scores. These are the propensities for people to buy, or is any kind of general propensities uh, on a on a on a batch basis, and it leverages events and people's profiles to do this. It's very very complex. It uses a lot of machine learning, Bayesian uh, technology to do this. Mm -hmm. So again. Apogee Insights is an Apogee product, yeah. and we're now going to spend a few minutes having talked about the generic architecture and what some other folks are doing, talking about how our product applies many of these concepts that, that we described. We have a you know we have a speed layer that's generating uh, the speed events, right. uh, and then we also have a microservices layer that uh, when an API calls in, leveraging Node.js, you can build a lot of your uh, decision logic and your mm -hmm. fallback logic in here. So I'm going to just kind of go through each, actually I'm going to go through each layer okay. in, in detail. So the batch layer, you can build your models via R because R is something that a lot of uh, data scientists, and increasingly developers are using as well. It's yes. very simple scripting. R has had a good year. R, R is, is, is getting trendy. So that's who, that, that, that's really cool. In fact, um, Slashdot just last week uh, talked about using R for AP math. Yeah, so AP math is kind of like the uh, high school math. Uh, yeah, so advanced high school math class. <laughs> advanced high school math class. Correct. And, and we spent a lot of time on tooling as well because even getting your, uh, your, your, the data after the, after the results are generated in your batch layer, having tooling to manage all of that mm -hmm. and then uh, pushing it into your serving layer is right. uh, non-trivial either. So here's, a, here's just some R code that you can script up. You know, we have an SDK on it. Yep. We have this uh, UI tool, so after the, 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 rec the results are uh, generated, you can push it to the batch layer of your choice. Mm -hmm. 
in this case, we use our API back. Oh, the serving layer of your choice. The serving layer, correct. Right. Serving layer of your choice. Okay. The, the speed layer, we talked to some customers and they don't actually want to have very complex speed layers. They want to actually be much simpler than, let's say, a Netflix. Right. And so what we've, what we've said is that, you know, use Node.js mm -hmm. and um, to do your simple aggregation uh, and use Cassandra counters, which uh, uh, you can use to make any kind of, kind of uh, you know, basically aggregates. It, that's good enough. You can right. you can actually script it all up yourself. So, so let's actually talk about about both of these layers in just just a little more detail. I mean, just going back to the batch layer. Yeah. Taking advantage of R, taking advantage of Hadoop for distributing data, you know queries over a huge amount of data. I assume there's some some algorithms and stuff. Are they all do you, are they all out of the box? Do you have to build them yourself? You know, I, are there canned kind of things that you can run? You know, what's the actual process for a customer to actually build something like that? Yeah, so the, the algorithm is out of the box and is very specific to uh, profile data and customer event data. Mm -hmm. So you just basically, you, you basically configure your data to go move into Hadoop, and there's a lot of tools for getting data into Hadoop. And if the data is profile data and event data, you just specify which streams there are, and it'll automatically generate the... Um, uh, generate scores okay. on a regular basis. Okay, so we're generating the scores via that batch. We're loading them into the into the back end as a service, which Correct. will serve as our highly scalable serving layer. We're going to talk about that in a sec. Okay, so now for the speed layer, what what you seem to be saying is basically, sure, there are great technologies out there. You can use Storm, you can use all these things, but for a lot of use cases, you just want to run some fairly simple logic. Yeah, you want to say like, tell me, just just calculate the top. Uh, the top products that are being viewed on a daily basis. Right. So then, basically, you can you can build some Node.js code. You can take advantage of the literally hundred thousand open source modules in the world of <laughs> Node. Um, you know, it doesn't have to be Node, but it happens to be that a lot of us are using Node, and that we have the ability to run Node within the Apogee product family. Yeah. So there's nothing additional to buy or to set up. Yeah. Um, and so so that's that's something that's been working well for us. And and let's talk about the. Um, the serving layer. So, yeah. it's you know a lot of times I've been asked questions like, hey, you know, why are you using this backend as a service? Why don't I, I see like Amazon uses Amazon and Netflix? They would use like Cassandra, straight Cassandra. Right. So tell us a little bit right. about well API Baz, right? Actually, is 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 actually based on Cassandra, um, and the reason it's based on Cassandra is because it's the thing that we have the most experience in and that we've had the most success with scaling horizontally across as many nodes as we need to large amounts of data scales extremely well, not only in that way, but it's also extremely available. You get high availability for reads and for writes. So it becomes practical, for instance, to have every API call. If you want to have every API call, do a little calculation and update BAS. That becomes very practical because the write availability is just as high as read availability. So even if there are infrastructure problems or network problems, even if it's among different data centers, it's still up. Right? And then it has this counter facility, which you mentioned, which I think is an, an, a very interesting bit of technology. It takes advantage of the, of the distributed architecture of Cassandra, which allows essentially different nodes to have different values of counters. And it makes it possible to do eventually consistent counting with low latency and extremely high write availability which means that it becomes very practical and, in fact, very efficient to do something like whenever a user looks at product X, update the counter for product X. It hardly takes any time at all. You can then query that counter. And these counters are eventually consistent, meaning you don't, if you've ever tried to deal with counting problems at scale, it's actually really, really hard. You don't want to go to one central server somewhere because there's too much latency and there's a single point of failure. So what Cassandra does is it lets you have eventually consistent counters. Yes, you will not get a 100% accurate answer up to the millisecond, but you will get a very, very close answer that is good enough without incurring all that additional overhead. And so we're talking about the really speed layer. Thing. Yes. That's good enough, right? Right. And, and in, in, in some cases, it's perfect to have that speed layer be, maybe it's not exactly the 100% perfect answer, but it's close enough, and then you can have your batch layer do the, the more accurate calculation overnight or whatever. And, and that's actually, the other part about uh, using a backend as a service over like using a straight Cassandra is, is queryability, right? Yes. 
Um, you know, if you have to, if you ever play with Cassandra and you try to set up indexes for querying, it is a pain in the ass. It is. It is. Cassandra programming is an art form, and it's not. It's not the kind of database that most people think it is until they start really using it. It's a very distinct and special way of doing things. Yeah, yeah, and, and that's what I like about the bad, the the bads as well is that, you know, when we want to create recommendations for hundreds of different scenar user case scenarios, you know, you don't have the you don't have the opportunity to muck around with the indexing every single time. Yeah. Right, and this allows the, the reason why um, you know we chose the bads for our speed layer. I mean, sorry, for our serving layer is because of the flexibility to solve all these different use cases. Yeah. But still manage at very, very high scale because underneath the hood is Cassandra. Right. And what we do is we give you a very easy to use API as well as a query language on top of it. And SDK. So right. this is an example of um, yep. uh, incrementing. We have a node SDK that increments the counters. Right. So basically the top of this code is basically just showing you how you name a counter and how you increment it. And of course, if you don't want to do that, there's, there's an, an API. And you can update it via the API too. So this layer is really interesting, the, the microservices layer. Right. Um, the one thing that's interesting about it that I find is that when an API call has come in, the first thing you want to do is you actually want to get the context of the API. So this is things like, um, based on the IP of the API call, right? you want to look up the person's location. That looking up of a location for based on IP, that could be another API call. It could right? be. Um, based on the location, you might want to look up the weather. That could be another API call. In fact, there's a lot of weather services out there that would use type in the address, the lat long, it'll give you the exact weather. Um, other thing, pieces of context is like, based on the OAuth token, right? Being able to extract who that particular user is. You need all that information to even construct a query against your uh, serving layer. Right. So that's where that's where like Node.js is great because it allows all these kind of concurrent connections. So I can use Node.js. I can essentially insert code into my API code path. I can, if my API happens to be running on Apigee, I can run there in Apigee. If not, you can still use Node.js. And it becomes a very nice way to orchestrate those kinds of web service queries and caches and calculations and things, right? Exactly. And, and the other part too that we use it for, after getting back all the scores, you know, the, you, when you look at a web page, it's not a bunch of propensity scores. It's actual product content. Yeah. So after getting the scores, you need to do a mashup to get with your other backend systems, your content management systems, your product catalogs, etc., to, re uh, to return the final result. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And one of the things I like about Node, and, and this is you know, this is this is my theme for the for the first <laughs> half of the year, is that you can have as many of these as you want. If it's not, it's it's realistic if you want to have tens or even hundreds of slightly different algorithms for different types of clients or do A-B testing or whatever you want, deploying a new Node app, whether it's to Apigee or whether it's via a, a microservices container on some other product, it's not a giant process that involves you know, 47 people. You can simply deploy it, test it out, you know, try it, see if it works, change it. You know, it becomes a very agile thing. So the other thing that we uh, that we use for building recommendation APIs and targeting APIs is Swagger, right? And I think I think this is kind of the um, you know enterprises now we're becoming API first. Having like a really good API for in rec for integrating recommendations in your system is really important. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's why you know you know we chose to use Swagger to help design all the recommendation right. APIs and targeting APIs. Right. And someone is ask, actually asking us if we can post a link to some sample code. Um, certainly for this Swagger-based API design and the user-grade stuff, we have a lot of docs online on Apogee.com. Uh, perhaps, I don't know if we can do it real time during this, but we can definitely put in a comment or, or attach to the slides some links to example code. That makes a lot of sense. Yes, definitely. Um, and, and, and sorry, that was just a little interjection while we had this, but I think that what you're showing here is, is we're doing a lot of work at Apogee with Swagger. We currently have an open source project called Apogee 127 that takes advantage of Swagger. It makes it possible Swagger is an API description format. Correct. So when I want to quickly say, hey, I need to build the recommendations API for my app, or I need to weave recommendations into my existing app, how quickly and how easy can I make it to define an API and wire it up to code in Node.js, that's what all of this work with Swagger and Apogee 127 enables. 
And if you look at like a look a little, a little more detail, you see this thing that says router controller recommendations. Yes. That's actually where the code runs. Exactly. That's where I'm going to show you a little bit of the code. So this yes. is the recommendations.js, and what you can see here is that it's kind of going through. It's basically making the API call to our back end of the service. Right. This is using the, this client.create collection. That's actually a user grid SDK call. Yeah. It doesn't actually create a collection. It looks it up, but yes, yeah. the way the SDK <laughs> works. Um, it's asynchronous because it might have to do something. And then once it gets that collection, now you're actually pushing out some records here. Um, and in many cases, I mean, I guess here you're actually updating a collection of entities. You could also use those calls we saw before to update a counter. Correct. And, and this, is, this is like this location over here is perfect place that, let's say you made a query to the, the back end of the service to get recommendations for a user. And it turned out that that user didn't exist. Yeah, uh, like anonymous user uh, case as well. You know, you can you can inject new fallback logic depending on your business. Right, right, right here, here and here. And you don't have to go through like rules engines or deploy Java code and things right. of that sort. Right, and and furthermore here, I mean, you're also using the power of Node.js to reduce latency. So for instance, here you're using the async library by calling async.each on line 57. Yeah. And what that does is that says, hey, I have a collection of recommendations. I want to update user grid in parallel. I just want to do you know four, five, eight updates all at once. There's actually a way to add a limit because you don't want to do a thousand all at once. Yeah. Um, and what that allows you to do is to reduce the latency. You know? yeah. So that when you want to call out to multiple services, maybe you want to collect recommendations from multiple services. Maybe you want to get the weather and get the recommended product at the same time. In Node.js, that kind of programming is, is natural. Yeah. Whereas trying to do it in Java, for instance, would be a much more difficult task. And, and what this code is actually doing, this, this, this loop over here, what it's doing is that after getting the scores from our API bath, um, it's actually, for every product that's recommending, it's making asynchronous calls to the product uh, catalog to get the data as well. Yeah. So right now, over here, this little code over here, it's making, let's say your uh, website has 40 recommendations, uh, recommended products, it's making 40 API calls in parallel. Yeah. And pulling all those results all at the same time. And again, in Node, that's you know not incredibly difficult code to write, which is one of the fun things about it. And and so the last thing is uh, you know being API centric. You know the, I think the, the the part that really makes uh, insights uh, different from let's say build you know, entirely DIY is the concept of having everything decomposed by APIs. So instead of having the batch layer write directly to Cassandra, it's writing through an API. Instead of having the speed layer write directly to Cassandra, it's via an API as well. Um, you know, th these are, these are this is useful because it enables composability, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. I was just looking. We had some questions about the code. I think people were trying to follow the code along. Okay. So I think what we should probably do is follow up either in these slides and maybe even a blog post. Sure. You may even have one already, actually, <laughs> um, to let everyone know that you know here's the example and here you can actually read through the code. Okay. So we kind of went over the code kind of quickly, <laughs> and I think they that, that that we didn't give people a chance to read it. So so we'll find a way to get a more complete example out there. And what's your thoughts on composability? Like, you know, why is why why is it really important that if you're implementing such a large system to yeah. uh, to have APIs? Well, I think that you know, I think a lot of systems now you're starting to see that there are multiple tiers of APIs. Perhaps you start off with APIs that simply wrap existing systems, you know, that wrap legacy systems and add a layer of security and performance to them. Um, perhaps you also have third-party APIs, like you mentioned, the weather forecast API or the you know, reverse IP lookup API. Um, and then the idea is a lot of people start there, but once they have that, using technologies like Node.js, using technology like Apogee Edge, even using an ESB or something, yeah. you could actually now quickly compose those APIs in a much more agile software development process. And I think so y you can do it. now. The reason why it's important that you do it is in order to give your customers the best experience and the best recommendations. And that's actually what we we try to do here. Like yeah. I got a, a what happened is that you know we may have a customer that does want to do something really complex in the in, on the speed layer. Yeah. So if they wanted to, if they wanted to, they can 
switch out Node.js or even add on top of Node, uh, like in, in on the parallel with Node.js mm -hmm. speed layer, Storm. Yeah. Right. But Storm still needs to write it to a serving layer. Yeah. And instead of figuring out, you know, a custom Storm to Cassandra integration, just making it available via APIs makes that integration so much easier. If every developer can call an API. There's no excuse. It's exactly. An HTTP API. <laughs> Absolutely. So, I mean, I think the one reason is that APIs are the simplest thing to integrate. And the other thing is that they become so simple to compose. And if you have a catalog of APIs inside the enterprise, you could do things. And I'll use Netflix for one last example. They have a different API for every device. And they have hundreds of devices. And in fact, they have multiple APIs for each device. And the reason is they want to have the absolute minimum latency for every screen on every device. That may be more than what a lot of people out there are doing, but the ability to do an A-B test or the yeah. ability to customize recommendations for different geographies or whatever makes the most sense. And rather than try and build one really, really complex piece of code that says, you know, if the user is in India but they're in the south of India, then, you know, don't offer them hamburgers. You know, that would be a lot more complicated versus if you could say, hey, the, you know, this is the South India recommendation engine. Yeah. This is the, you know, Bay Area recommendation engine. You have a lot more flexibility in how you write your code. Yeah, exactly, exactly. All right, so kind of uh, just wrapping up here, you know, from a summary perspective, you know, this context-aware apps today is the new benchmark. We expect all our apps that we get from, whether it's a Facebook or an Amazon, to be very contextual. It should know what you're doing. From an architecture standpoint, microservices, Lambda architecture, Lambda architecture, these are two new architecture styles that mm -hmm. are agnostic of technology that you can, that you can use. Yeah to compose a really high, high scale, high performance system. Uh, Netflix is one of those companies that, are really, uh, that has uh, successfully implemented this. Uh, and then last but not least, um, you know, Apogee is trying to help companies implement these architectural styles mm -hmm. uh, as well. Yeah, and, and, and I think the, the, the more specific stuff you got to was that by combining these things too, you know, looking at using Node.js possibly as part of your, your your serving layer and your speed layer, um, the ability to use a highly scalable, low latency backend as a service for your serving layer becomes really, really important. Stringing it together with APIs gives you a lot of flexibility. And you can switch, and having, having all these things via APIs allows you to switch any part of that Lambda yes. architecture up. Yes, excellent. I think that's the end of the slides. I don't see a huge number of questions, but if you guys have more questions, please feel free to post them to the Q&A. Um, I'll point out again that the video will be available at youtube.com slash Apogee. The slides will be available at slideshare.com slash Apogee. Uh, there might be a blog on, I think it's apogee.com slash blog. Um, we had a bunch of this stuff at the beginning of the presentation. Um, and yeah, it sounds like a lot of the questions were, you know, they enjoyed looking at our code and they want to see it. <laughs> in more detail and in a format that's more easy to browse, so we should find a way to do that for them. So, so, I, so there was a one question that just came that, that I was sent previous to this was, uh, you know, you have all these, what, what do I do with all these data sources? Like how do I actually get these data into both my speed layer and, um, uh, and, and my batch layer? Like how, yeah. how, do I, how do I distribute the events? Yeah. Any, any suggestions or thoughts? Um, I mean, I think that at some point you might need to use some, some messaging technology, right? I mean, that's, that's one of the, I mean, I think for a lot of use cases, and especially for, for simple use cases, having that code in the path of the API is a very, very effective and simple way to do it. But at the same time, I think that um, it might also be interesting to talk about uh, sometimes you need to scale bigger. And that's where people start to look at you know, using a messaging system like Kafka or, you know, using message queues or a publish subscribe system. I don't know if that's what you're getting at, but mm -hmm. that's something that comes to my mind is that, you know, I may now need to, and, and furthermore, we have this problem internally at Apogee. We have a huge stream of data coming through. We want to do speedy processing of some of it mm -hmm. and batch processing of some of it and long-term archiving because we think we're going to need it in a few months, but we're not exactly sure what for of mm -hmm. some of it. 
we found that using a message broker kind of architecture where we can publish a message and then we can control without having to change the publishing code where it goes um, and add new consumers and change consumers has been a very big advantage to us. Yeah, Kafka is interesting because when LinkedIn, <coughs> LinkedIn was the creator of Kafka, one of the things that they built Kafka for was they wanted to be able to write quickly into Hadoop, but also be able to real-time stream yeah. it as well. And so they actually, if you go to Kafka, one of the, the earliest use cases, and this is open source code you can get, yeah, it's very, very is popular for us. run MapReduce on a regular basis. It could pull, these mappers can pull the data in parallel off of the queue, mm -hmm. write it straight into Hadoop, and kick off the next MapReduce job very, very quickly. So that's, yeah. that's a and, and there are whole pipeline architectures that you can construct with these things. And there right. are many, many technologies. Flume was an early one that we see less of these days. We see a lot of Kafka. Um, and and that, you know, because it just scales very nicely and, and horizontally. Hey, we got some more, uh, some more questions. Most of the questions are, will you have slides? Yes, we will. Slideshare.com slash Apogee. Will they have talking points? I hope so. Um, trying to see if I could read this question. I can't seem to get the whole question there. Any examples on how this architecture or what? Um, does anyone know how I actually read that? <laughs> Any examples on how this architecture, that's a good question, whatever it is. Um, uh, used for M to M or sensor oh, devices. Oh, okay. There okay, we go. yeah. So that, that's actually, actually, let me, I actually have a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, knowledge on this. So uh, sensor devices uh, is event data. It's lots and lots of data here, right? And so being able to have a message broker, as you just talked about, be able to uh, stream all the uh, data to Hadoop very quickly is really important. Right. Uh, so, so um, you know, making sure, and there's a lot of uh, cool formats nowadays on how to stream sensor data down to, into, into Hadoop. Yeah, yeah. And, and we're seeing, I mean, a lot of people, I mean, the MQTT protocol is used a lot in the IoT world for that. You know, Kafka is a, big heavyweight Java zookeeper thing that works great inside the data center. It's not a publish subscribe system. It would fail miserably outside big data centers. But MQTT is very lightweight. Yeah. Uh, it's a very simple protocol. AMQP is an earlier one that we use a lot internally at Apogee. MQTT is even simpler than that. You know, these are all lightweight protocols that can be fit into lots of different things, right? And so what you would do is that you would use the batch layer for processing. Um, you would actually use both the speed, you would use a speed layer to process the sensor data that's happening yeah. in the last day or so, yeah. uh, over the last hour, and you would yeah. use the batch layer to process all the sensor data in the last you know, right. month, a year, et cetera. Right, and, and then you know, again, the idea of having a queuing system makes a whole lot of sense because what we've got here is, um, you know, what, what we've got here is, uh, you know, slow networks, unreliable networks in many, many, many sensors, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Um, I think we're getting to the end. I'll plug once again slideshare.com slash Apogee and youtube.com slash Apogee. Um, and uh, we'll, so we'll also uh, take a look at some stuff on the blog. Thank you. If there's nothing else, thank you very much.